some of my favorite 3D projects to make are music visuals. And today I'm going to walk you through my complete process for making them. And in the end, I'll also be going over some useful tips and tricks to help you elevate your work to the next level. So make sure to stick around till the end. First, we'll need a 3D model of our musical artist. And for this, we can either make one ourselves or get a pre-made model. I actually have a full video on how you can create your own custom models. So check that out if you're interested. I've also created my own character pack with a ton of pre-made models that you can check out. They're fully rigged so you can pose them or animate them however you like. And then lastly, you can also find models on CG Trader or Turbo Squid. But sometimes these models can look a little off. So just make sure you find one that looks somewhat decent. Now in a new Blender scene, we can start off by importing in our character model. And depending on where you get yours from, it'll probably be a slightly different process. For me, I'll be using a model from my character pack. And for this, I can go into File, Append, and then select a character from my character pack. Now here I can go into the Blend file, then the Collections folder, and then select everything that's inside. And this should append my character into my new Blend file. Now that our model is in the scene, let's look into creating our first visual. So by default when we imported our character, it came with a camera and a lighting setup already. And that means if we now switch our render engine to Cycles and go into Render View, we'll get a good idea of how our model will look when it's rendered. Now for this video, I wanted to create an ASAP Rocky visual inspired by some of his recent music that he has released. Now the concept that I had was of him hanging outside the window of his custom Mercedes-Benz 190E holding the American flag. Now because I wasn't able to find a 3D model for this car, I had no choice but to model it myself. Luckily I was able to find a pretty identical model on Blender Kit. And then I spent a couple of hours modifying this model to match his custom Benz. And in the end I had a model that looked pretty identical to the original. I also made sure to rig the car with the rig a car add-on so I can easily animate it later on. So at this point we have our rigged character and our rigged car. And now comes the challenging part, which is animating our character. Now before we start animating, I'm going to first go into my character and hide all the hair particle systems and then also reduce the subdivision modifier on my character. This will just make it a bit easier for me to move my character around without it lagging or being slow. And if you're using characters from my character pack, then I would highly recommend you do the same. And now we can also delete the default outfit because we'll be adding one later on anyways. Now I'm going to bring back the car into the scene and set it up at the origin point. For now we're just going to use it as a reference to know where to place our character. So I find it easiest to have the character model at the origin point in an A pose on the first frame. And this is mainly for when we add in the clothing later on in Marvelous Designer. But for now let's set a keyframe for our character on the first frame. And we want to make sure that we set our keyframes on our character rig and not the character itself. Now in the timeline, we can move up by 25 frames or so and then move our character to the rough starting position for our animation. And once we have that set, we can add a keyframe there as well. So now our character should go from the origin point to the starting position for our animation. Now the reason we picked 25 frames is because this gives us enough buffer room to be able to nicely simulate the clothing. Now going back to the first frame, we need to do one more thing here which is add an initial keyframe for the bones in a pose. So with the rig selected, let's go into pose mode. Essentially, we have these individual controllers that are supposed to mimic bones in the body, and we can use these to either pose or animate our characters. All of my characters from my character pack use the meta rig. It's extremely powerful, but it can be a bit complicated for beginners. I would highly recommend watching a couple of tutorials on the meta rig to get familiar with how everything works. Now by default, all the controllers might not be showing. We can go into the data tab and then here it'll show layers that we can hide or unhide. And I'm just going to unhide a couple of the controllers I'll need when I'm posing my character. This includes some of the controllers for the legs and then for the fingers as well. And then from here we can select all the bones and then add a keyframe for it on the first frame. This will ensure that my character stays in a pose on the first frame and then goes into the pose for our animation. And now once again, we can unhide the car and then start to pose our character in their initial starting pose. And here it's nice to look at references to make sure that your poses look as natural as possible. And finally, when I had my starting pose done, I selected all the bones once again and added a keyframe for it. So now my character goes from the A pose on the first frame to my starting pose for my animation on the 25th frame. Now at this point, you might be wondering, how do we actually animate this character? Because currently it's just in a static pose. Now, animating is a very difficult thing to master. 
and I'm personally not good at it at all. But a trick that I like to use is to add small micro movements to the bones just to make the character feel alive. And this actually works surprisingly well. You can apply this trick to pretty much any static pose and your animation will already start to look a lot better. And just make sure you have the keying option turned on. This will automatically set your keyframes as you move and adjust your bones. And this is very much a trial and error type of process until you get something that you're happy with. Another alternative that is great for beginners is an animation library called Mixamo. They have a ton of free animations that you can use, but your options do tend to be pretty limited. Now after an hour or so, I was finally done animating my character. And I was actually pretty happy with how it turned out. Now let's talk about how we can add an outfit to our character. And for this, I like to use Marvelous Designer. It's my go-to software for adding outfits and simulating them. And I made a full crash course on this as well on my channel if you're interested. Now first, we'll need to export our character as an Olympic file. And here, we just want to make sure that we have the selected objects checked and that we remove the hair particle systems, since that'll just make the file size even larger. And once that's done exporting, we can move to Marvelous Designer. Now in Marvelous Designer, we want to first import in this Olympic file. And once the character is imported, we can start to create our outfit. And like I've mentioned before, I have a full video on Marvelous Designer and how you can create custom outfits for your characters. So I'm not going to cover this in too much detail here. But for this project, I created a simple outfit using one of my template packs. And then lastly, I also added a wind controller as well. This will add wind to our simulation. And of course we need this since our character is going to be in a moving car. And when we're ready, we can press the record button to bake in the animation. And this process may take some time depending on how fast your computer is. And once the baking process is done, we should see this pink bar on our timeline. And then from here, we just want to make sure that our UVs are in a one by one square and that nothing is overlapping. And now we can export our outfit as an Olympic file. Now in the export settings, I like to export my outfits with the thick option selected and 4K resolution for the textures. And once again, this exporting process may take some time since the Olympic file tends to be pretty heavy. Now back in our project, we can import this Olympic file. Now here, we just want to make sure that the scale is set to 0.01. .01. And when we import, our outfit should fit perfectly on our character. And now if we play our animation, our outfit should move perfectly with our character as expected. Now by default, when we import in our outfit, it's not going to have a material attached to it. And we can see that if we go into the shading editor. To fix this, we can select our outfit and then add in a new material. Down next, we'll need to use the Node Wrangler add-on. So we want to go into Preferences and just make sure we have the Node Wrangler add-on installed. Now we can select our principal PSDF. And then if you press Ctrl, Shift and T, we can select all the texture maps for our outfit. And now we have our texture maps applied to our outfit. Now by default, the outfits might look a little too shiny. And to fix this, we can go into the specular tab and then just reduce the IOR value a little bit. And now it was time to add in the American flag. And for this, I went through pretty much the exact same process that I did for the outfit. And here I also used the tack feature in Marvelous Designer. This allowed me to pin the flag to the hand. And when everything was set, I baked in the animation and then imported it into Blender. So at this point, the issue that we have is that if we move our car, our character doesn't follow. And the easy solution to this is to select our character rig, our outfit, and our flag, and then parent it to the car body. And now we can see that if we move our car, our character will follow. And now we can add a keyframe for our car on the 25th frame. And then we can go to the last frame and move our car by a couple hundred meters or so, and add another keyframe there as well. And then with our keyframe selected, we can right click on our timeline, go into interpolation mode, and select Linear. This will just ensure that our car moves at a constant speed. So now that we have our character and our car animated, let's now go over lighting and composition. First, let's go into Render View. And here we just want to make sure that we're in the Cycles Render Engine. Now, because we don't have any lighting in our scene, our scene's very dark. One of my favorite lighting methods is using a sky texture. The default settings can be a bit harsh, but if we lower the elevation value, we can create a beautiful, soft sunset effect. And then from here, we can add additional lights as well. In my case, I just added another area light. And then I had to parent it to the car so when the car moved, the light moved as well. Now let's spend some time going over composition. First, I'll add a camera to my scene and then place it where I want the focus to be. I like to think about the composition and the angle that will best capture the mood I'm going for. And here, it's very helpful to look at references and inspiration. This will help guide your own camera setup and ensure your shot feels intentional and engaging. Now we can also parent our camera to the car so that when our car is moving, our camera follows as well. Now a camera add-on that I love to use is the Camera Shakeify add-on. 
It's perfect for creating a more organic and dynamic looking visual. They offer a ton of different shakes to choose from. And then you can also play around with the parameters to customize the effect to fit your scene. For my visual, I set the shake to investigation. And then I also reduced the influence to make the effect a bit more subtle. Another thing that we can change is the focal length of the camera. This allows us to control the field of view, giving us the flexibility to create either a wide expansive shot or a more focused close-up perspective. For my visual, I'm gonna go for a 20 millimeter focal length, and then I'm also gonna move the camera closer to give it a more stylized look. Now, another way to make our visual feel a lot more dynamic is to add a lot more camera movement. To do this, let's first add an empty object into our scene, and then let's parent this empty object to our car. Now, next we're gonna unparent our camera from the car and instead parent it to this empty object. So essentially, our empty object is parented to our car and then our camera is parented to the empty object. So when the car moves, it moves the empty object, which also moves our camera. Now, this may sound a little confusing and I don't blame you, but the reason we do it this way is because now we can keyframe this empty object and move it around however we want, yet it will still follow our car. Now we can start adding keyframes to our empty object to animate the camera's movement. This will allow us to create some dynamic shots around our subject. By controlling the position and rotation of the empty object over time, we can guide the camera through the scene exactly how we want. And this is where your creative freedom really comes in. You can play around with keyframes to create anything from smooth cinematic pans to fast dynamic shots. Now, our current scene is pretty simple. We just have a character and her car. But in most cases, you'll probably want to build out a complete scene. And this is where an add-on like Blender Kit really comes in handy. Blender Kit is an add-on that allows you to import 3D models, materials, and completed scenes straight into your project. I found this city scene that I thought would be perfect for my visual. While I didn't end up using it in the final render, I still experimented with it to see how it would fit in. It's always a good idea to test different assets to see what works best for your project. Now we're pretty much almost done. The last thing I want to cover is compositing. So let's open up a compositing window. And here we just want to make sure that the use notes option is checked. And to be honest, in most cases, I keep things pretty simple here. The first effect that I like to add is the lens distortion effect. Now we won't be able to see the effects until we enable it in the viewport shading settings. And then in the camera settings, under the viewport display tab, I also like to set the pass value to one. And then we can play around with the lens distortion parameters until we get something that we like. And another effect that I like to add is the glare effect. And for this as well, I like to experiment with the different parameters until I get something that I really like. And then lastly, I also want to make sure that I have motion blur turned on. This just adds that extra layer of realism to the final render, making fast movements feel smoother and more natural. And now let's go over a couple of settings before we render our final visual. In the render properties, I like to set the max sample size anywhere between 256 to 500 samples. I find that this range strikes a good balance between quality and render times. Now in the output properties, we can also change the aspect ratio and resolution for our camera. Here is a list of the most common ones you might want to use. 1080 by 1920 for short form content like Instagram Reels, TikTok, or YouTube Shorts. For a widescreen or cinematic look, then you want to use 1920 by 1080 resolution. And if you want to go for a classic TV look, then you want to use a resolution of 1440 by 1080. For my file format, I like to use FFmpeg with an encoding type of MPEG-4. And with that, we're ready to render our final visual. Now that is it for the main content of the video. Now I'm gonna go over some additional tools and tips that I think you'll find valuable. First, let's go over how we can create a fisheye lens effect. And this one's actually pretty simple. With our camera selected, we can change the lens type to panoramic. And then we wanna make sure that we have the fisheye equisolid option selected with the following parameters. And this will give us a nice fisheye lens to work with. It's personally one of my favorite effects to add because it makes every visual stand out so much. Now another great tool to play around with is the depth of field. We can start off by adding an empty object into our scene. And then in our camera settings, we can turn on the depth of field option. We can then select our empty object as a depth of field object. And now by moving this empty object, we can make a specific point a focal point of our scene while blurring out areas farthest away. And we can use this to achieve a more cinematic look for our visual. And of course, we can also keyframe this empty object, which will allow us to guide the user's focus from one point to another. And then lastly, we can also experiment with the aperture values to change the amount of blur in our scene. Now let's go over another camera technique that I love to use, which is camera tracking. Once again, we can add an empty object into our scene. And then with our camera selected, we can go into the constraints tab and then add in the track to constraint. 
And here we can select the empty object as our target. And now if we move our empty object, you'll notice that our camera follows as well. And this can be super helpful for keeping the camera locked on a specific subject. And now instead of moving the empty object, we can also move our camera directly. This gives us even more flexibility to experiment with different angles and movements while still keeping the focus on our target. And now if we keyframe our camera, we can create some nice dynamic shots. And that is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next one.